I want to thank you all for coming. I think given current events and what's happening in the world right now, including the most recent round of energy sanctions uh, just about a week ago, this is a very timely gathering to discuss the role that natural gas is playing in the current conflict between uh, the U.S. and Europe uh, and Russia and the Ukraine. And I'm very pleased today uh, to be able to release the center's latest research report, which you all have on your chair, American Gas to the Rescue. Uh, that's a question. The role of U.S. LNG exports on European security and Russian foreign policy. Uh, I'll say briefly, this report was co-authored with Trevor Hauser uh, of the Rhodium Group, an economic research and advisory firm. He just emailed me to say, I'm trying to get out of the UN, and I'll be there soon. So Trevor will hopefully be here in time for our panel discussion. Uh, I want to acknowledge and thank Akosh Loge, uh, a research assistant at the Center on Global Energy Policy, who did excellent work on this, Matt Robinson for his uh, tireless editorial work on it, and all of Trevor's colleagues at the Rhodium Group, in particular Shashank Mohan, for their research and modeling work on the report. What I'm going to do is briefly summarize the content of our report in about eight minutes or so. Uh, and then, uh, as I said, we'll have the honor of hearing from the UK Secretary for Energy and Climate Change, Ed Davey, after which uh, the minister and I will have a conversation on stage about many of these issues. If you have questions that you'd like to pose, you have index cards on your chairs, please write your questions on those cards, uh, pass them to the aisle to be uh, collected, uh, and then we will pose uh, them to the minister. Uh, the same during our panel conversation. For those watching online, and I know we have uh, lots of people watching online right now, I was just told, uh, you can send in your questions via Twitter, at Columbia U Energy, and the hashtag is pound CGEP, C-G-E-P, Center on Global Energy Policy, CGEP events. Uh, and we can take your questions that way as well. Uh, after our conversation with the minister, Trevor and I will be joined on stage for a panel conversation with Carlos Pascual, a senior fellow here at the Center on Global Energy Policy. Uh, until recently, uh, he led the Energy Bureau at the US State Department, which he founded, former ambassador uh, to the Ukraine, special assistant at the White House, for Russia uh, and Ukrainian issues. Teddy Cott, the head of gas analysis at EDF. Tim Fry, a colleague of mine on the Columbia faculty who studies Russian history and directs the Harriman Institute. And our conversation will be moderated by Ed Crooks of the Financial Times. Uh, Laszlo Vera, the head of oil and gas, the head of gas analysis, sorry, at the IEA in Paris uh, was uh, was uh, unable to join us due to the Air France labor strike. Uh, so unfortunately, he won't be here, but we have a great panel. So um, let me uh, turn quickly now to uh, spend, as I said, just a couple of minutes letting you know what's in the report that you all have uh, in front of you. Uh, and then we'll turn to our conversation with Minister Davey. So what motivated Trevor and I to do this were the number of times uh, that we've heard uh, various people get on TV, both U.S. politicians, and you see some of them here, but also Europeans as well, to talk about how the U.S. can save Europe from Russia and free Europe from the grasp of Russia if we just send them our gas and solve the conflict in the Ukraine uh, uh, in, uh, overnight. And there are huge benefits to U.S. LNG exports, and we talk a lot about those in the report, but we thought it was helpful to separate the rhetoric from the reality uh, and try to, if you look online, for example, and Google the phrase, hit Putin where it hurts, you'll see a ton of stuff being said about LNG. And we weren't sure all of it was entirely sensible. So we tried to say what's happening in the U.S. gas market and what does that mean for Europe and what does it mean for Russia. We all know what's happening in the U.S. gas market, a stunning turnaround in just the last five to 10 years. U.S. gas production, the blue line here, going up sharply. U.S. natural gas prices coming down uh, also very sharply. And you can see how dramatically the outlook has changed uh, for what people thought the U.S. natural gas import needs were going to be. The dotted line here is the annual energy outlook from the U.S. Department of Energy less than a decade ago, 2005, and that is where they thought U.S. natural gas imports were headed, and you can actually see what has happened to them. Uh, the U.S. imports very little gas today, and the U.S. will soon be uh, a net exporter of natural gas. The impact that that's had on the global gas market has been uh, really quite profound for many years, as many of you know. Uh, global gas prices were pretty closely uh, in line with one another, and that relationship broke apart just a few years ago. With U.S. gas prices coming down very sharply, they've rebounded a little bit into sort of a four to five uh, uh, a range for a while. Uh, the price for a while of Asian gas was in sort of the 
16 to 17 range, the price in Europe in the 10 to 11 range, although both prices have come off quite a bit recently, a lot of storage, a mild winter, uh, but it's not at all clear those will stay at the low prices they are right now. Europe, uh, as I, you know, we'll talk about with the minister in a moment, um, has much more of a challenge with regard to import gas dependence than the United States. The U.S., as a share of total energy consumption, imports relatively little natural gas. Europe is dependent on imports for, as we all know, much, much more of its natural gas. Europe imports about two-thirds of its natural gas, and about half of that supply comes from Russia. So what has happened in the last couple of years as the U.S. has produced, we haven't exported yet, we export a little bit to sort of Canada and Mexico, but let's assume we haven't exported yet, but we've had a shale boom. Well, I showed you a minute ago what was supposed to happen was we were supposed to be importing huge amounts of, uh, of natural gas into the U.S. All the growth was projected to be in the form of costly liquefied natural gas. Suddenly, you know, countries like Qatar have built up capacity to send us all their LNG. Suddenly, we don't need that uh, anymore. So this has freed up the ability to put a lot of uh, gas uh, onto the global market, created more liquidity, more diversity of supply, more competition, and that has had an impact on the global gas market. We've seen, and we list in the report, I think it's table two, the number of contract renegotiations that Gazprom has already undertaken, Statoil as well has undertaken contract renegotiations, in response to this new competition, we've seen the price premium that Gazprom can fetch in the European market get squeezed. Uh, you see here a comparison of 2007 and 2013 and how gas is being priced that's being sold in the different regions. So you can see that in Asia, for example, uh, gas for the most part, 85% roughly, is sold on the basis of long-term oil index contracts. Obviously, the spread between gas and oil is very high right now, and that's led to much higher prices for the gas being sold into the Asian market. Europe has seen quite a fundamental transformation in its gas market in just the last six or seven years, with a much larger share of gas being sold on the basis of gas-to-gas -gas competition, of actual supply and demand for gas, uh, as, uh, compared to what was the case less than a decade ago, uh, where much of the gas was sold on the basis of long-term oil-indexed contracts. One interesting question, not the, scope, not the st subject of this study, is whether we'll see a similar transition uh, in the Asian Pacific market, and that's the subject of another study the center has underway over the next year or so. Uh, but this has been uh, partly a result, not entirely a result, but partly a result of the increased competition supply that we've seen put on the global uh, market. So then we said, uh, now what ha that's just from the U.S. having you know, a gas boom before we even export it all. Then we said, what happens if now we start to export, which we will start to do uh, next year and then increasing supplies over the next several years. And model the result of what it would mean if the U.S. puts a lot of gas into the global market. You shift the supply curve, you create even more competition, even more diversity of supply. The effect I just showed you before gets magnified even further, and we see downward pressure on prices even more. And so you can see here uh, what the difference of the U.S., uh, let's say, exporting in the dark blue bar, 9 BCF a day, which is roughly in the middle road of sort of the consensus forecasts that are out there, maybe 8 to 10 BCF a day is what people think we might do. 18 would be very high, but let's say 9. Uh, what would that do to European gas expenditures? And we find that putting 9 BCF a day of U.S. gas into the global market reduces European gas expenditures by about $21 billion. This is in the 2020 to 2025 timeframe. That's about an 11% reduction in European gas expenditures. Conversely, if you're selling gas, you're getting less for that gas. And you can see here Russia takes a pretty big hit. There was an article about our study in the Financial Times today, and this was what they chose to focus on, was what it means for Gazprom in particular. When you're talking about gas exports from Russia, you're mostly talking about Gazprom. Uh, around $24 billion a year, again, the 2020, 2020, 2025 timeframe. That's about a 27% reduction in gas export revenue relative to the counterfactual where the United States was not exporting gas. So that's a big that's a big difference. You save Europe a lot of money, you cost Russia a lot of money. But we find uh, that while that effect is true, this is not still a solution to the current crisis, and it's limited in some ways in terms of the impact it can have on changing Russian foreign policy. And let me quickly mention three reasons why. First, it bears reminding, although we all know, 
we're not sending this gas to the global market anytime soon, right? The first uh, project from Chenier and Sabine Pass comes online next year. The next several projects uh, toward the end of the decade. Government permits in the US are flowing now. This is not because of a restriction in terms of permitting. It just takes many years and many billions of dollars to put these projects together. So it's gonna take time. We also find that while prices come down, so Russia gets less, Europe spends less, the share of European gas that comes from Russia is not changed very much by US exports into the global market. Europe's still getting most of its gas from Russia. And that's because Russia is still the lowest cost supplier in many cases into the European market. Russia itself is dependent on Europe as a market. It doesn't have a lot of alternatives. And even the deal with China now is being sourced by different fields in the East. Uh, and also because, I'll show you in a moment, US gas, uh, the, the, the effect it has on price starts to push out some other supply that would have come onto the market. And that's what you see here. So one interesting finding, I think, in the report was that when the US puts 9 BCF a day of gas onto the global market, you increase total global gas production by only 1.5 BCF a day. And that's because increasing supply shifts the supply curve, lowers price, and makes several projects in different parts of the world uh, less economic than they would otherwise be. You see Africa, for example, the costly East African projects for gas get hit particularly hard. And then also US gas consumption goes down a little bit because US gas prices are a little bit higher in response to the higher demand from exports. And as I said, you can see Russia is still the low cost supplier relative to many of the alternatives. And then finally, in terms of influencing Russian foreign policy, it's worth remembering that gas is, uh, while it's a big hit to Gazprom, it's a fairly small share of Russia's overall revenue. They get much more of their export revenue from oil than they do from gas. Gas makes up about 3% of Russia's GDP, about 14% of its total energy export revenue. So this is meaningful for Gazprom. Questionable how meaningful it is to actually force the Kremlin to take a different policy position. So US gas has, uh, a very important impact uh, in increasing diversity of supply, increasing liquidity, increasing competition in the global gas market. Lots of domestic benefits, too, that I haven't gone into, but uh, let's posit those are there. But to really capture the full benefits of this, then we walk through some of the policy reforms that we think are important for the Europeans to undertake on their side uh, to really not only reduce dependence on Russia, but reduce the vulnerability Europe faces to a potential disruption in Russian supply, because as I said, they're still going to get most of their gas from Russia. And I won't go through all these. They're spelled out in some detail in the report, but uh, increased investment in infrastructure, pipelines, particularly uh, to connect Central and Eastern Europe and North-South pipelines, as well as East-West. Uh, we've seen uh, efforts, policy reforms to promote a more integrated gas market uh, and EU competition law efforts against Gazprom. It's important to move forward with those around destination clauses and other things. Uh, increasing gas storage capacity to be able to weather any potential disruptions. Increasing Europe's own production of natural gas, uh, as well as other sources of energy, renewables in particular, to reduce dependence on Russia. And then boosting energy efficiency to reduce uh, demand. All of those things, we think, those policy reforms, combined with LNG exports, not just from the US, but Lots of LNG supply will be coming into the market by the end of the decade from Australia and elsewhere. So that increased LNG supply in the world, combined with those sorts of policy reforms, we think can go a long way uh, toward creating a more liquid and diverse gas market and then giving uh, the Europeans a chance to be more resilient and reduce the leverage that Russia has in the European gas market. So that, and so this just sort of summarizes uh, what I just said. Uh, the US shale boom has already helped uh, European uh, consumers, uh, already hurt Russia by freeing up lots of volumes. Europe's bargaining position has been strengthened, and US LNG exports will just further uh, have the same result. Uh, at the same time, it's not a solution to the current price crisis. It doesn't free Europe from the need uh, for Russian gas. Uh, and the question about what impact it has on Russian policy uh, is informed by the fact that it's a big deal for Gazprom, but not as much of a big deal overall for energy export revenue. So that is a short version. Uh, I think we're right on time uh, of the study. And I said, oh, Trevor's here now. I see him in the back. So uh, that Trevor and I uh, did. And so what we're going to do now is uh, uh, I'm going to, uh, we're going to pull this up. I think, right here. There we go. And while that's happening, I'm going to introduce uh, our keynote speaker uh, for our conversation. 
Uh, so I'm, as I said, I'm really delighted that Minister uh, and honored that Minister Ed Davey uh, could be here today. Ed Davey was appointed as UK Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change in February 2012. Uh, those of you who follow <clears throat> international climate policy and international climate negotiations know uh, that Minister Davey has been a passionate voice on the need for all of us to take much more aggressive measures to reduce carbon emissions uh, and to deal with the threat of climate change. Prior to his current role, he was the uh, minister in the Department of Business, Innovation, and Skills, and before 2012, held a number of shadow positions, including shadow foreign secretary. He became a liberal MP in 1997 and was a consultant before that and holds degrees from Oxford and London University. We're really honored to have him here today for the release of this report and our discussion about European policy uh, and Russian policy and European energy security. Please join me in welcoming to Columbia University Minister Ed Davey. Well, Jason, uh, thank you for that. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's good to be here at uh, Columbia. Um, it's also good to be uh, a minister for the United Kingdom. Uh, it's a relief uh, that things went the way they did. Otherwise, perhaps I wouldn't uh, be here. And I certainly would give Jason the difficulty of knowing how to introduce me. Um, it's also good to see a presentation which you uh, agree with. Um, when I, I was told that you'd just done a report, I was worried what on earth the conclusions would be and whether it was a, I was enter, entering a controversy. But uh, by and large, I agree with uh, the, the findings of that report. So it certainly matches uh, the UK's thinking. And indeed, a lot of what you said means that I'm going to re be repeating a few things, but uh, repetition isn't always a, a bad thing. It, but it's good to, to start off my remarks by uh, reminding people how strong the UK-US relationship is uh, in so many things, but of course in energy in particular. Um, the work that we have done together over many years is critical. Um, I've enjoyed working with Secretary Monnet on a number of areas, uh, not least the G7 uh, in Rome when we were discussing uh, th these issues. And I think, uh, I wouldn't want to put words into uh, Ernie's mouth, but I think uh, we saw eye to eye uh, on, on many things when others perhaps didn't. Um, it's good that we are uh, revisiting energy security in this sort of more profound way because there's so many changes at the moment around the world that are affecting how we think about the uh, security uh, challenge globally. We've got the major energy shifts, of course, uh, shale, uh, the US moving from a net importer to a net exporter, the overall uh, wider liquidity in, in global gas markets, and also a lot of the technology issues which uh, uh, you alluded to, particularly around renewables, but also uh, around uh, new nuclear, around energy efficiency, around carbon capture and storage, indeed around energy storage. There's so much technological development that, that is impacting the way people are thinking about energy policy in the future. Um, of course, climate, which you refer to, is something I'm sure we're all passionate about. Um, that's going to require major, is seeing major policy shifts in energy as we factor in decarbonisation along with price and security as the objectives of energy uh, policy. And uh, combined with those energy shifts, those, those policy shifts, we're seeing political shifts. Um, we're seeing the significance of the emerging uh, economies uh, and their demands and, and uh, what they could add uh, to supply. And of course, behind your report, in many ways behind uh, me coming here, is what's happened in Russia and Russia Ukraine and the implications for the European Union and, of course, for, for global uh, markets. So I will, uh, as, the, as Jason's done, focus most of my remarks on the challenge uh, that Russia has posed to our thinking on energy security. Um, there are some short term issues we could go into. Uh, certainly in the European Union and around uh, our uh, cabinet committees in the UK, we are thinking about uh, the near term, this autumn, this winter, uh, and the next year or two, uh, what we can do uh, and um, uh, what we may need to ask help for, both to support Ukraine, um, but also to protect those Central and Eastern European countries who are on the, the front line. And we've already seen moves uh, in Slovakia, in Poland and Hungary uh, to, to pipe gas uh, uh, into uh, Ukraine with uh, new reverse gas flow pipelines uh, being uh, uh, implemented. 
Um, but really my uh, remarks are going to focus on the longer term challenge and how that is affecting the thinking in the European uh, Union. And I wanted to start really on the politics of that because um, you wouldn't expect uh, a union of 28 countries to agree on everything. And um, uh, surprisingly enough, we don't agree on everything. But we do have a way of getting consensus uh, around critical issues. And I think the uh, political commitment in the European Union to take on the challenge that Russia poses is, is stronger than many people uh, realize. Um, I think there, there is a political will to um, think about this issue in a way which we haven't done uh, for many a long, a long year. Um, and it's come at a time when we were already thinking longer term about energy policy. We've been working for two and a half years or more to um, a 2030 package, we call it, on energy and climate change, which is focused uh, on the climate change challenge. But of course, the link between climate change policy and energy security is very, very close, much closer than many people uh, realize or in sometimes even want to admit. Um, and so the energy security challenge, which has come on top of that uh, rather more recently, um, has, I think, given a, a catalyst to some of those discussions. And uh, some of you may be aware that uh, at the end of next month, the 25th of October, there is the next meeting of the European Council, that's the uh, heads of state of the 28 member states of the European Union, and a, a critical item on that agenda is both the 2030 Energy and Climate Change Package and the Energy Security Strategy for the European Union. Um, and I know we're trying to move away from hyperbole uh, with, uh, at a university, but I would say that the discussions and the decisions that that European Council could take uh, in a month's time could be of pretty historic importance for European energy uh, policy. Um, uh, there's a lot of preparation work that's already been done. There's still quite a lot of negotiation uh, to take place. But the fact that uh, we've had already made such preparations with respect to the climate change piece, I think means that we can take some big steps forward um, Clearly then there'll be a lot of implementation issues and sometimes it can move more slowly than you'd like in the European Union. But the new European Commission, I think, will be very much focused on gas supplies, on oil supplies, on refined product supplies, uh, as well as implementing the climate change uh, package. Um, but of course it's all very well talking about you know, political will, the decision-making process. What are the concrete actions that form uh, that package. Well, let me focus on five. Uh, one is the single market, the second is infrastructure, the third is energy efficiency, the fourth is low carbon, and the fifth is in indigenous fossil fuel supplies in the EU. Um, the single market uh, in energy in the EU has long been talked about. There have been a number of measures. We've had three packages of how we're trying to ensure that gas and electricity can flow across uh, borders. Um, uh, and uh, we have made some progress over the years. But the level of interconnectivity between European member states is still uh, too low. Uh, uh, you might be surprised to know that some of the connections between the UK and continental Europe, despite us being an island, is actually stronger. Uh, those interco interconnections are stronger than there are between some uh, 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 continental states that border each other. Um, so there's some way to go to imp improve the connectivity. Um, and also some of the detailed codes and uh, standards and regulations that are required to uh, make sure that gas and electricity can flow according to market uh, principles. But this whole debate around energy security has given a much greater focus to completing Europe's single uh, uh, energy market. And I am as confident as I, as I can be that um, we will see big progress on completing that market in the next few years. Um, already, the, uh, the measures around ensuring that the th what was called the third package, the third uh, EU energy single market package is implemented, has really accelerated, and I think um, uh, pressure is being put on those member states who've been laggards up to now. So in many ways, that's great, not just for security, but also, of course, for, for price. A critical part, though, of completing the single market isn't just the rules and regulations around it, it is the infrastructure. 
Um, and uh, we have been uh, slow, I think, in seizing the opportunities to build that necessary infrastructure. Um, if you look back six months and you looked at what Europe was doing, we had a Connecting Europe fun, uh, Fund, um, and we had, I think it was 241 projects of common interest. And these projects of common interest were infrastructure projects to build pipelines and electricity and connectors and the like, which were designed to be the, uh, uh, the, uh, the networks to, to, to make the single market uh, work in practice. The problem was having 241 projects of common interest meant that not very many got built. There were just too many. There was not enough focus on what the priorities were. And uh, what the Russian uh, uh, threat has uh, meant is that we have now been able to get agreement that we need to focus down from 241 projects to a dozen or two dozen projects. Um, and of course, most of those, not all of them, but most of them are in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, in the Baltics, uh, where the uh, greatest dependency uh, is. So um, uh, that infrastructure, I think, that boost to the infrastructure that's needed um, uh, is, is, uh, is really happening. Um, one of the things, though, I don't think we've yet grappled with, which is a genuinely difficult one, and I think you'll see it as I describe it, is that quite a lot of this infrastructure could be built along market principles, that you, know, you would expect money to flow into a lot of these projects because they, they make sense uh, uh, in, in commercial terms. Um, it's been difficult because some of the countries haven't had the money to afford it and there's been some other barriers, but essentially it, it does make economic sense. But when you're talking about energy security, sometimes there are some projects which might not get built by the market. And you know, we've got to discuss, I think, and have some hard uh, questions about whether there are you know, the marginal LNG terminal, the marginal gas, light, gas pipeline that um, uh, is going to need some, some intervention. Uh, and obviously there are some difficult issues there to, to, to face up to, but what has happened uh, in Ukraine, I think, uh, has created a political will so we can, can, can try to answer some of those harder questions. But the energy efficiency is very much a part of our debate and it's very interesting coming over uh, to America because I've done uh, quite a little bit over the last two years looking at what the Obama administration is doing particularly in relation to its climate, uh, national climate plan and the role of energy efficiency there. So different contexts but still focusing very much on energy efficiency. Uh, and that is uh, uh, where, where climate and security come, come together. And in Europe, while there ha has been overall, particularly in Western Europe, a relatively good record, I say a relatively good record on energy efficiency, there's still huge amounts uh, to capture. And that's particularly the case in Central and Eastern Europe. And getting the uh, market mechanisms right to incentivize the investment in uh, you know, low-hanging fruit uh, in terms of energy efficiency uh, potential is what, what it's about. And we, certainly the European Commission is, l is looking at uh, uh, financial investments and uh, guiding existing financial institutions to try to be able to mobilize the capital to, to, to take that advantage. And of course, that has uh, significant energy security uh, benefits. The fourth is the low carbon options. Uh, we are seeing big increases in renewable investment, have done for some time. That's been partly driven by what was called the 2020 deal, which was struck in 2008 in the European Union, uh, when the European Union agreed that by 2020 we would reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 20%. We would have 20% uh, of our energy coming from renewable sources, and we'd uh, improve our energy efficiency performance by uh, 20%. And we've seen a lot of investment in renewable energy. Some of it's been uh, shall we say, the expensive side. Uh, we've not done it necessarily in the smartest way. Um, uh, the UK has tried to re ensure that uh, the transition to renewables, the investment in renewables has been done at the lo lowest cost, but you know, we've not always succeeded. But we have recently, through the Energy Act 2013, which I pushed through Parliament, created what we believe is the world's first ever low carbon market to make sure whether it's renewables, nuclear or carbon capture and storage, we're investing in low carbon uh, generation capacity in the cheapest uh, possible uh, way. And of course, it's not just in energy, we're seeing it in transport uh, as well. So we do see 
uh, low carbon electricity with renewables at the front, but not, not just renewables, as critical to our response to both climate and energy security. Fifthly, and, 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 uh, uh, and finally, in, in this sort of concrete actions that we're taking in Europe, is uh, ensuring that we are maximizing the potential from our indigenous fossil fuels. Uh, the UK has been, uh, in many ways, blessed in, in Europe because we have our North Sea oil and gas. Um, uh, I commissioned a guy called Sir, Sir Ian Wood to uh, conduct uh, a review to make sure we are maximizing the, uh, the economic potential from the North Sea, and we've got some new ideas uh, to, to do that. Um, but of course, there is the unconventional oil and gas potential in the European Union. Uh, not all our colleagues uh, in Europe uh, see this as their most favorite topic. Um, we've been one of the member states who've said, you know, uh, there's nothing to be afraid of here. With the right regulatory regime, you can uh, tap that oil and gas in an environmentally friendly and uh, acceptable uh, way. That's what we've been doing in the UK. Uh, we're very much at the early days of uh, exploration, but we've put in place what we think is a pretty robust set of regulations which will help on a pretty densely populated island people to be able to uh, support uh, this, uh, new, this new, I say, inverted commas, move. Um, and I think you will see across Europe as uh, uh, gradually, rather more slowly than you did in North America, but gradually realizing that uh, potential. And of course, what's happened in Russia and UK, Ukraine has given a boost uh, to that. But as we deal with th these uh, challenges, it's not just action within the European Union, and vital though that it is, it's working uh, with other partners in Europe who are outside the European Union and other global uh, friends and allies too. Um, uh, Norway, of course, in, in the European context, is a critical role to play with it, its reserves, but also colleagues like Qatar, uh, and indeed, uh, I believe, this will take some political uh, initiative, but I think colleagues in North Africa can also play a strategic role in meeting these uh, challenges. Uh, and given the you know, increasing interconnectivity of, of global gas markets, though they'll never be as integrated as, uh, as oil markets, but um, uh, they are more integrated than they were. Uh, and of course, they, they have ramifications, as your charts were showing. Um, what's happening in Australia, I think, is obviously uh, really important. And of course, what's happening here in North uh, America. And when we were working uh, in Rome uh, earlier this year for the uh, G7 Rome Initiative, we were very conscious of the need uh, to uh, reach out beyond European, uh, the European Union to uh, ensure that not just European countries, but frankly any country in the world, um, can find ways to reduce its reliance on unreliable uh, suppliers. So let me end really by talking about the US role in this. Um, I wasn't going to come here, and I'm not coming here, to say, please come to our rescue. Um, uh, but I do think uh, the U.S. role uh, can be critical in this. Um, I wouldn't say I've got close uh, sources to the Kremlin, um, but uh, I think it is true to say that the shale gas revolution has already caused consternation in Moscow. Um, this was not a welcome development. This was not foreseen, and already I think it has uh, unnerved some of their planning and undermine some of their revenue uh, forecasts. Um, but uh, if the US, uh, I think, grasps the export opportunity, not just to Europe, frankly, but to the wider global market, I think that will have another impact. It won't fundamentally change the fact that Russia is a major supplier to the European Union, of course, just as your slides show. But the fact that it can uh, change the terms of trade is of itself important, and because it enables us to transition with all the other measures I've talked about, whether it's investment renewables, energy efficiency, and so on, uh, I, I think it can support uh, that uh, transition. And combined with those measures, it does send a strong political signal. And when we were discussing, uh, when the energy ministers of the G7 were discussing our political response to uh, Russia's more aggressive position, 
Um, we really weren't just focusing on LNG exports from North America, vital though we are, and we would want to encourage you uh, to be bold on that, don't, don't uh, misunderstand me. But we were really clear on that diversification in all elements was absolutely the key, the key uh, uh, mantra. Um, and maybe I should uh, uh, end uh, on this, and that's to, to say that um, uh, the announcement by uh, Rockefeller Brothers uh, fund today that they are disinvesting from fossil fuels, uh, investing in clean energy, is the sort of signal that probably goes down worst of all in Moscow. Um, that's not to say we aren't going to need lots of fossil fuels in the decades to come. I think we produce, for example, in the UK something we call the Carbon Plan, which is looking how we are going to meet our ambitious climate change objectives of reducing our carbon emissions by 80% by 2050. And in that Carbon Plan, we see a lot of oil and gas being used in the UK up to 2050. So fossil fuels are going to be needed in the years ahead. Of course they are. But we also know that we're going to need other sources of energy and therefore I think clever strategic investments in these new technologies is essential and will be very, very unwelcome in Moscow, Tehran and other places around the world. So uh, I think this is an exciting agenda uh, and I'm delighted that the UK and the US will together be leading the way. Thank you. really expansive comments across a whole range of topics uh, related to our report and beyond. We have um, just under sort of 25 minutes for questions. I promised the, we'd let the minister get out uh, promptly on time. Uh, I'm going to kick it off with a couple of questions. As I said, there are cards uh, on your chairs. Please uh, write any questions you have, pass them to the aisle, and then we'll collect them and, and, and we'll pose uh, questions here. Um, so uh, I was going to ask you a little bit about the role U.S. LNG exports could play in the European market. You, you spoke about that actually already. Um, so maybe if I could ask you uh, uh, if you could talk about a little bit more about the role of U.S. LNG exports, but then also oil export policy, because we're having a discussion about that here in the U.S. Um, what impact do you think U.S. LNG exports and oil exports, and they're different, uh, would have on European energy markets, on European energy security? Uh, and then I wanted to ask you a little bit about sort of how you how, how that how important that issue is in the current trade negotiations for the TTIP, how, how, uh, how you see the Europeans prioritizing that issue? Well, maybe I start off uh, from that point of view. Um, the TTIP uh, negotiations, I think, are very, very welcome for so many reasons. Uh, I think the, the US and the EU showing their deepening, their already strong economic relationship uh, is a critical signal to send to the rest of the world. Um, but I also think putting energy uh, within that uh, it, and we would like to see you know, a full chapter on that, if possible, I think uh, is, is particularly helpful. We may not get that chapter. There are many different ways, perhaps, of uh, getting agreements on the energy piece, um, but I think it would be uh, of strategic significance. Um, and you know, what impact would it have uh, in the European Union ma markets? Well, beneficial. <laughs> um, uh, you know, if we can uh, save... European consumer uh, money, well, that would be very, very welcome. Uh, and if we can reduce the, the, the coffers uh, of, of the Kremlin, that's also uh, uh, helpful too. Um, uh, I think you're right to say it's not the silver bullet. Um, uh, there is an awful lot of hyperbole around shale in all elements. I mean, there are parts of the British press which would have you believe that shale gas will solve all our energy problems and that prices will fall dramatically in the UK. Um, that's not our analysis. Uh, we think there are a whole set of reasons to suggest that even with significant uh, US LNG exports and significant fines of, uh, and, and production of shale gas in the UK, we're not going to see dramatic falls in, in prices. But of course it will make the market more liquid and that's got to be uh, beneficial. Uh, with respect to oil, um, uh, difficult to say. Um, uh, we've yet to see any serious flows, of course, coming from North America. And, uh, most analysis suggests that I've seen, maybe you can inform <coughs> me if I'm wrong, is that the gas will come first and maybe the oil may not happen. Um, but it, it, the, the fact that there's new oil supplies on the global market is going to be beneficial to the European uh, economy. And I think that would be my, my key point. 
Yeah, and I think the key difference is probably that with oil exports, we'll most likely remain a net importer. So if we're exporting a certain kind of oil, we'll be importing a different kind, and you know that has impacts, different impacts than gas. Can, can I give a little codicil? The issue that um, actually I'm more concerned about is the impact that we're seeing on the EU's refinery sector. We're seeing a lot of EU refineries close uh, because the uh, American refineries are able to, are operating at capacity levels they never really ever ever were designed for because they can get a good margin and import their refined product into the European Union and uh, that's causing quite a lot of stress in our uh, refinery capacities and we've got to address that uh, because it's a serious issue because while you know uh, at the moment it's very easy to uh, and good that we've got a good ally like the U.S. Uh, importing refined product, uh, we're also uh, got to make sure that our energy security long-term issues are thought about with respect to refined product as well as unrefined product. Right, right, right. Um, can you, uh, I was going to ask you, uh, what steps you think the U.K. can play to ensure adequate gas supplies in continental Europe going into a crisis situation or into Ukraine this winter, which may face real difficulty, depending on what the weather is like, but uh, you can really see a crisis there. What are the steps that are, uh, you talked about some of them, but that can be taken to really make sure that gas supply is, uh, is adequate in the case of any sort of disruption? Well, a lot of measures have already been taken uh, and um, are continuing to be taken. One thing that we learned back in the the first time we had this crisis is the need to to get much better information and to act together. So um, I think it was back in 2007, it was agreed that uh, member states should be able to do what they call gas resilience analysis, looking at their situation and share that with other member states. So. Over the last few months, each member state's been doing some pretty deep analysis about their own particular uh, resilience to a number of scenarios. One scenario being that uh, gas via Ukraine would be cut <coughs> off for a month or for six months. Other scenarios being that Russian gas would be cut off totally. And we've been stress testing each member state's situation in those different scenarios. And the Commission's been collecting those and hasn't yet published them all, but we've got sort of whispers of mm. what some of them are saying. UK is, uh, thanks to uh, North Sea <coughs> Gas in particular, our pipelines with Norway and so on, is probably the most energy secure in this, uh, in this regard. But, you know, um, it's clear that some of our Eastern European colleagues uh, are more exposed. So uh, whether it's uh, gas storage, uh, whether it's... Um, uh, particularly to help Ukraine, whether it's these reverse uh, flow gas pipelines and gas technology that I talked about, those are the sorts of things that are, are happening. I don't think any, no one should be under the illusions if it's a really cold winter um, and if Russia does really uh, pile on the pressure, things are going to get difficult. Um, uh, I think, by and large, in most scenarios we're going to get through, uh, but there's no guarantee. Uh, and uh, Ukraine will, could have some difficult times ahead. Uh, and that's, I guess, where <coughs> the G7 and, and colleagues and uh, partners and allies outside the European Union you know, have a role to play, particularly the US. How, would you say the UK views Russia as a reliable supplier of gas? Was that changed recently by some announcements that they were reducing gas supplies to Poland, to Germany, to some other European countries? We sort of talk a lot about the leverage that Russia has, uh, and, and we've seen it in certain cases. But on a general basis, how, does, how would you say in the UK you view uh, Russia's reliability as a supplier of gas to the European market? And has that changed recently? Well, just for the record, we get less than 1% of our gas from, right. from Russia, uh, which um, you know, is a, I'm delighted to be able to say to the House <laughs> of Commons on a regular basis. Um, but in terms of uh, other uh, member states, um, you know, overall, let's be clear, Russia has been a pretty reliable supplier, um, and um, that's one of the reasons why I think countries like Germany have been uh, saying uh, in many circles, you know, let's not get too panicky. Um, and one of the reasons why they're a reliable supplier is they need uh, our cash, <coughs> and they need, they need a market. So it, it isn't a totally asymmetric relationship, and I think that is probably uh, well understood. Um, but, but we have seen in, twice in recent past, and I think we've seen very recently, 
few early signs that they are capable of using uh, energy as uh, part of their uh, foreign policy, shall we say. Um, and um, uh, therefore, responsible governments need to prepare for that. And we need to send very clear signals that it should be markets that decide where energy goes, not, um, not uh, political coercion. How are the sanctions uh, against Russia being viewed in the UK? Is there broad support? How are businesses in the private sector viewing sanctions? What uh, impacts have you seen them have? Do you think they will have? I think it's pretty broad support, to be honest. Um, obviously, t two of our biggest energy companies, BP and Shell, have got big interests uh, in Russia. Um, and uh, we, we talk to them, but they're clear as indeed other companies and other EU member states are clear that there are bigger issues at stake here. Um, and we have to ensure the wider security of the European Union. We have to have solidarity with our uh, East and Central European and Baltic uh, partners. Um, and th I've been you know, pleasantly surprised by the willingness, not just the political establishment, but the wider uh, establishment to contemplate you know, tough action. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, uh, without going <coughs> into too many details, I don't think it's been London that's been um, uh, uh, the, the reluctant uh, discussant at these, uh, these issue, on these issues. There are a couple of, uh, we have a great, bunch of great questions here, and to draw a few themes out from them, there are several that don't focus on gas, but talk about the relationship between gas and other sources of, of, of fuels. Uh, so we've seen uh, coal enjoy somewhat of a resurgence in some parts of Europe, while gas demand has been flat. The UK has been one of the few, I think, large states still quite supportive of nuclear power. Um, can you comment on those two, what you see as the future of coal uh, relative to some of the trends that we've been seeing, and also for nuclear power? Well, on coal, I'm sort of uh, quite a strident radical because uh, <laughs> I think if we're going to take climate seriously, uh, you look at the science, you look at the IPCC reports, you know, coal uh, has to be cut back on, seriously. And if you look at our analysis, we are assuming that our coal power, plant, uh, power plants will be effectively phased out in the next uh, decade. Now, of course, uh, one of the reasons why we're investing so much in carbon capture and storage is that if we can make that uh, technology commercially viable at scale, then uh, there is a future for coal that's fully abated. Um, so it's not, not a done deal that uh, coal hasn't got a future, but I think unabated coal uh, hasn't got a future. Um, and one of the reasons why we're so keen to revive and reform the uh, Europe's carbon market, the EU ETS system, is to send a very clear signal uh, in that uh, regard. Um, uh, it's challenging for some of our colleagues um, and one of the big issues that we'll face in the next few weeks as we go to the 25th of October in the European <coughs> Council uh, and try to get a 2030 package on climate change is where coal fits into that, particularly for uh, our Polish colleagues. Um, but um, yeah, you know, from a UK perspective, I think we're pretty clear on the very strong direction we're, we're, we're heading in. Um, in terms of nuclear, I sit here as someone who's always had my concerns about uh, nuclear, um, not least on price. Uh, if you look at the history of the UK's nuclear industry, it has not been the cheapest form of electricity. Uh, and um, given that over two thirds of my departmental budget now are being spent on cleaning up nuclear power stations um, that have long since uh, stopped producing electricity, we're still bearing the cost of an industry which proved to be rather more expensive. So I, uh, as a, an economic liberal, have always had some concerns about uh, some of the costs. But I've changed my <coughs> mind to be far more open on nuclear for the simple reason of climate change. You know, we are, in many ways, at the early period of tackling the climate change threat. And to take a low-carbon technology, a proven low carbon technology mm -hmm. off the table now seems a bit ill-advised. And as we embark on what I think will be a third generation of new nuclear, and we'll see a, we will see a nuclear renaissance in the, in the UK, it will be because properly priced 
uh, carbon uh, means that on most of our internal analysis, nuclear can be competitive. And so you talked about the need to reform the carbon market to get a better price signal, and then there have also been you know, policies that have been supportive of, um, of, of renewable energy, uh, and also growing energy prices are becoming an increasing concern for the public uh, in the UK and elsewhere. Do you think those sorts of higher electricity prices we've seen are um, necessary to get to a decarbonization, and will there be public support for it? Um, well, keeping the public with, with you uh, is vital for any government in a, in a democracy. Um, and um, I would say more than that, as a constituency MP, um, you know, I, my job is to serve my constituents. And when I see vulnerable constituents who've got homes that aren't well insulated, haven't got double glazing, uh, and I see their fuel bills, it is my job to worry about those people. Um, so I take the price of energy very seriously. Um, and you know, the best response to those challenges is energy efficiency in all its forms. Um, and uh, if you look at our analysis, the, the efforts we're making on energy efficiency, whether it's on insulating people's homes, whether it's moving them on to cheaper fuels, uh, whether it's product standards on the appliances they use, really very important actually, um, uh, those can reduce the, the, the actual bills they pay. So prices may be higher, but because they're using an awful lot less, mm -hmm. their bills aren't going up. So energy efficiency is a fundamental part of squaring the circle as we have to make some of these investments, which you know, come at a price, um, but look after people who are struggling. Uh, um, you call it on Main Street, I guess. <laughs> Right. Uh, there are a couple of questions here, too, about shale gas. You touched on that in your, in your, in your remarks. But you know, can you talk a little bit about how significant a role you see shale gas playing uh, in the UK's energy future? And do you see the concerns throughout Europe increasing or decreasing? What role do you think shale will play more broadly on the continent? And how would that be impacted by the sort of climate policy you talked about? Well, we're creating a framework so that uh, if we can, if we find shale in large quantities and that it's commercially viable to, to produce that shale, uh, then um, we'll be there and we'll be probably the first EU country there at scale. Um, and if that sounds very caveated, it's because we don't know yet. And we've got the British Geological Study, we've got a number of studies which suggest there's a huge amount of shale there. Um, but we are way behind you guys in terms of the number of wells that have been drilled. We're still very much at the exploratory phase. Um, I hope for our energy security, our climate change, our uh, economy that we are successful, but I can't sit here and tell you that we are definitely going to have a shell uh, boom in the, the UK, but you know, we are certainly open to that. And one of the things I've been doing is to make sure we avoid what's happened in some other European countries uh, and that is that we, we reassure people that we're going about this in a way which is um, sensitive to their communities, but is sensitive to the environment. So we put in, you know, uh, I think you might be surprised the level of detail we've got in our regulations. We've got regulations about seismic events. Uh, uh, we've got regulations about methane emissions, regulations about, um, you know, water uh, sustainability. Uh, already in place, even though we're at the early stage of our ex exploration phase. Um, but that is part of reassurance of the public. Um, and I think if we can show both the British public and then through a successful shale gas exploration and production phase in the UK uh, that it's possible, then I think other European countries will come, up, come, come behind us. Already Poland mm -hmm. uh, um, has uh, made some efforts here. Um, not as successful as I think they had hoped, um, but um, there is lar there are large. Uh, sh we are told we are told by the experts there are large shale gas uh, reserves in France and in Romania and a number of other European countries. So the potential is there. I'll turn to another question from the audience. How do you see the EU's anti-competition investigation of Gazprom playing out? I welcome it. Um, as someone who uh, <laughs> hugely believes in competition, and we've got to make sure that. Uh, companies, wherever they are from, wherever they are from, um, uh, do not abuse their market uh, power. And uh, there are a number of American companies who may not have liked the uh, uh, antitrust rules in the European Union, but 
Di diplomacy suggests that I should move on. <laughs> um, uh, there were the, another question here about sort of the, um, you mentioned that some projects, some pipelines will be commercially viable, some may need government support. Uh, there's a question here sort of to the same point about LNG facilities uh, in the EU but also elsewhere. Do you see government playing a role to help support the development of LNG uh, facilities uh, to bring increased supply into the EU? I think that is a potential. At the moment, uh, our LNG capacity in Europe isn't fully utilized. Um, of course, it's not always in the right place. Um, so, you know, there are issues, particularly in those states that are probably more vulnerable, uh, about whether or not there should be LNG terminals built that might not get built if you simply left it to market forces. I won't, you know, be invidious and name one or two uh, places, but um, uh, I think we're not there yet. Um, but I certainly think, as I made made clear earlier that we need to start contemplating that. Um, and, uh, you know, I think I've made it clear that they're going to be more to Central and Eastern Europe than, than to, to Western Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another question here about sort of the future of global gas markets. You talked about the massive supplies of LNG that are coming into the market. What do you, do you think we'll see? What, how, how different do you think the global gas market will look? How different will it look in Europe? Have we seen sort of the end of oil indexation? Uh, and are we really starting to see the creation of, uh, uh, you know, gas uh, hubs that create real gas markets? You know, as a politician, when I'm asked those questions, uh, I will get a bit nervous about answering <laughs> them, particularly at uh, uh, this uh, Centre for Global <laughs> Energy Policy, when you've got people who really know the answer. Uh, out there, um, and you're asking me to go into the, the crystal ball. Um, uh, I mean, it's got to be good that the, the LNG market's going to be more liquid, um, but there are so many factors that are going to, to influence how that develops. I mean, take one example. Um, will Japan, uh, you know, refire its, uh, all its nuclear reactors? That's going to be quite a, a big impact, at least in the short and medium term. Uh, demand for, for, for LNG. Um, uh, what will China really ex uh, be successful in exploiting its shale gas uh, reserves? These are sort mm -hmm. of quite strategic uh, questions, uh, which give a you know make it more difficult to answer those questions with a a with clarity. And given you you show the Department of Energy's um, uh, estimates uh, going slightly awry, uh, I think I'll leave it there. Uh, so let's maybe we'll close in the last minute or two just by turning back to Russia. Can you say a little bit more about um, how you see the um, sanctions policy playing out? What kind of uh, reactions would you expect to see uh, from Russia, and what does that mean for gas supply coming into uh, Europe? You think in the in the, in the near term? Well. When we've been thinking and debating sanctions, both in the UK <coughs> and the European Union. We are not out to provoke a fight with Russia. We're just trying to mark her card and just try to send a clear signal uh, that you know uh, this is this you've gone over you've crossed the line. And there are two schools of thought about whether we've gone far enough and what Russia will do. And there's one school of thought that says Russia isn't taking us seriously thinks that we haven't got our act together, that we, you know, we are bluffing and wouldn't go uh, any further. Um, and there's another school of thought, which is that we have um, taken it by surprise. Mm -hmm. um, you probably have to be an expert in uh, uh, criminology, if any of those criminologists still exist around there, or uh, you'd have to be... Um, uh, someone in the secret services to uh, really understand the answer, mm -hmm. know the answer to, to which of those schools of thought uh, is right. Um, I think it's vital <coughs> that we stand up to uh, any sign of Russian aggression. And we need to realize that if we allow her to think that she can reinvent the world and create another new Russian sphere of influence in the way that the Soviet Empire was, um, that that will have huge long-term costs. And so early action, using some of these economic and energy tools, I think is the right way. And I think if we don't um, 
make strong, clear signals. I think we'll live to regret that. Uh, that's why I do hope that although US LNG isn't the silver bullet, mm -hmm. I think it is part of a strategic answer. So, um, you know, I, kn I know your conclusion <coughs> through your report uh, weren't that it's the only game in town. I don't think it needs to be. I think it's part of a European uh, and uh, G7 and beyond response to what Russia is doing. Uh, because if we allow her to, to be able to, you know, uh, dominate not just Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, and then, you know, put pressure on uh, former communist states that are now part of the European Union, I think that is a very dangerous, uh, would be a dangerous set of events. And I think, you know, we need to draw the line early. And just to clarify, you mentioned that strong support in the UK. You see that across the EU, there's a uniform consensus in support of strong sanctions. I mean, you know, some countries get hit harder than others by these sanctions. We've seen German exports to Russia fall, I think, by half recently. So you see strong consensus within the EU to move forward? Um, it depends what the question is. <laughs> um, we have, as you will have noticed, a set of tiered sanctions. We've gone up through gradually ratcheting them up, um, and events have enabled the arguments to, uh, to gain traction that we needed to strengthen those sanctions. So I think that's a sort of diplomatic way of saying we weren't always at, uh, uh, the same, on the same page, but we've gradually begun to uh, understand the, the situation in, in a similar way. Um, you know, the next level of sanction, of course, begins, you might, you might say, to get really serious. Mm -hmm. um, uh, quite how we, one would approach that, when we'd approach it, how it would be done, I think would take some discussion, and I think uh, the US would need to be part of that debate. Well, um, it's easy for us to sit in New York and, and write reports about European energy security, but to be joined uh, by the UK uh, Energy Minister to really get your firsthand perceptions and reactions to our study and uh, hear such a broad discussion uh, of what's happening in European energy markets is incredibly helpful. We're very honored that you took the time to be with us during your visit to New York. Please join me in thanking Minister Ed Davey for joining us today. So if I could ask our uh, panelists to come up on stage and our moderator, Ed Crooks, we'll put a few more chairs on here. Well, thanks very much indeed, Jason. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks very much for inviting me to moderate this session in this fantastic theater. I feel as though we should be singing you a song or something, you know, possibly doing a stand-up routine, but uh, we will try and be uh, uh, as entertaining as we can short of that. Um, Yes, why not? Do, do, well, no, why not? I mean, I'll, I'll just, it's all right, I'll, I'll introduce myself. Sorry, I'm, uh, as uh, you've probably seen in your program, I'm uh, Ed Crooks. I'm the US Industry and Energy, Energy Editor at the Financial Times, and I'm uh, based here in New York. And I'm del delighted to be joined by this extremely high powered panel uh, to discuss these issues. Um, perhaps I'll start over on my extreme left here, though I don't think we should draw any conclusion from that. Um, uh, Professor Timothy Fry, who's the director of the Harriman Institute, thanks very much for coming along. To his right, we have um, Trevor Hauser, who's a partner at the Rhodium Group, the consultancy. To his right is Teddy Cott, who's the head of global gas analysis at uh, EDF Trading. To his right, Ambassador Carlos Pascual, who's a fellow of the Center for Global Energy Center on, sorry, bigger problem, the Center on Global Energy Policy here at Columbia, and also a former um, Special Envoy for International Energy Affairs at the State Department. And last but by no means least, uh, here on my uh, immediate left, we have uh, Jason Bordoff, of course, who is the director of the CGEP here. You may notice we have, as they say, a change to our published program. And I don't know, sorry, if we've already had um, apologies from Lazio Varro from the International Energy Agency, who's unfortunately not able to be here owing to an Air France strike. So in a kind of, you know, Europeans doing their best to confirm <laughs> everybody's prejudices about them. And uh, clearly, uh, the good news is, obviously, though, they're uh, bolstering European energy security by not using all that jet fuel. So I suppose we should uh, be grateful for that. I'm going to add one thing to your intros, which is uh, Teddy is also a graduate of Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. So we think it's important to bring back our star graduates to show people what everyone goes off to do. So. <laughs> Thanks very much for that. So look, what I wanted to do really to start off is to ask everyone a question that Ed Davey said it was impossible to answer, which is um, what are Russia's intentions? He, he talked about the Russian threat and uh, mm -hmm. 
uh, I wanted uh, really to kind of try and pin down your ideas about what the Russian threat is and just to get a sense of, you know, what are we worried about? And perhaps before we go on to talk a little bit about solutions, you know, what is the problem we think we're facing here? Of course, as is um, very often said, um, Russia was an extremely reliable, or the Soviet Union was a very reliable supplier to the West, to, to Europe of gas right through the Cold War. Um, since then, we've, we've seen more disruption, but again, Actually, the amount of, uh, of disruption to European gas supplies we've seen has not been huge. I wonder, though, are we perhaps now moving into a world where we are nervous about Russia really seeking to use gas as a weapon and thinking that it could be very serious disruption to European gas supplies? And I guess uh, I mean, a thought to throw into that is clearly um, people often talk about the Russian gas relationship to Western Europe as being one of symbiosis. They are uh, selling gas to Europe. They need uh, the revenues from those gas sales as much as Europe needs the gas. And so people often put the argument in those terms to say, actually, there probably isn't really much of a threat. But I'm interested to really to get the panel's views on that to kick us off. I mean, perhaps, mm -hmm. Professor sure. Fry, do you want to start off with some sure. thoughts? Sure. I'm, I'm more in the latter camp of when I look at uh, uh, Russia, Russia today as being also dependent on uh, sales of gas to uh, Europe. Um, there's been a lot of talk in Russia about a shift to the east uh, as, as an alternative to Europe. But if you think about it, it took 10 years for Russia and China to reach an agreement on, uh, on the gas trade. And it, the economics of it are very difficult. You have to build a very long pipeline. The infrastructure costs are, are very high. You have to go to fields that are you know, not pleasant places to be. Uh, when we talk about Siberia, uh, this is the, the nasty part of Siberia. So that tells you just uh, how difficult, uh, how difficult it is. Also, the economy in Russia is slowing down. Um, since President Putin came back to the presidency in May 2012, almost every quarter growth rates have declined from around 4% down into the, you know, le less than 1% and the outlook uh, does, not, uh, does not look good. So I think for those reasons, uh, I think it's going to be, although as, as much as the Kremlin might like to use gas as a weapon, um, uh, they're constrained in ways that I think we should take into account. Thanks very much. Trevor, mm -hmm. you, you agree? Yeah, please. Uh, sure. I mean, I... I uh, won't speculate on Russian intentions, but uh, I think the recent pipeline agreement with China was an indication of, kind of Russian weakness, not Russian strength. I mean, that in a couple of decades of traveling to China, that pipeline was just about to be signed, and they could never uh, come to terms on price. And, uh, uh, and over the past few years, the Russian negotiating position has been weakened considerably, and so the Chinese were able to get a price that worked uh, for them to make that pipeline happen. Uh, you know, that said, I think that uh, just looking at it through an economic lens, uh, Europe still needs Russian gas more than Russia needs European demand for its gas, if you think about its role in the economy. And that's, you know, for, from a Russian standpoint, it's just money. And from, a, from the standpoint of certain European states, it's keeping the lights on. And, uh, and I think that was one of the kind of interesting findings of this work uh, for me was that, you know, you should think about that leverage not in quantity terms, but in option terms, right? Uh, how much gas Russia sells Europe is actually a very poor indicator of how much leverage there is in the relationship. Uh, we buy 80, 90% of our toys in this country from China, uh, including the frozen theme tchotchke that now fills my house. And, uh, and that provides China with very little geopolitical leverage over us. And that's for two reasons. We can live without that stuff for a period of time. I mean, I will have to tolerate a high degree of annoyance for the next year, but I can live without it. Uh, and other countries can make it, right? Uh, whereas with Chinese rare earth exports, when we had the crisis a few years ago, there were no other options and we needed it for supply chains, right? So, uh, so that the increased kind of diversification of supply uh, can change that uh, balance of power, even if the quantities don't change. Right. So, so to be clear about that, you're not recommending the U.S. establish a strategic Disney Princess Reserve, then, which could be, you know, I, I, I have one in my in my garage that I'm willing to rent out to other yeah, people. Pri private sector management of it. Yeah, it's going to work. Teddy, your thoughts. Sure. Well, I'll join Trevor in not speculating about what Russian intentions are, but I will say that that's clearly what's made it difficult for everybody, for all of the other stakeholders involved to actually respond in a, a coherent manner because nobody really knows exactly what Russia wants from a strategic perspective or even from a tactical perspective. And that's been very difficult for everybody in the private sector and the public sector. Um, that being said, you, you asked if we think Russia is uh, 
is likely or willing to use gas as a weapon. And I think the, you have to be more specific in that question, say a weapon against whom? Because at this point, it's pretty clear that in the relationship between Russia and Ukraine, natural gas has played a very important geopolitical role. And there is a monumental um, commercial conflict that's embedded within this geopolitical conflict that we see. But any damage that's done to Europe as a part of this is very likely to be collateral damage and not intentional. Russia does want to maintain Europe as a key export market. We have talked a bit about Russia opening up the eastern route into China, but that's not going to be uh, flowing gas in meaningful volumes until around the end of the decade. And at that, until then, or even through the, the, the ramp up of the Chinese pipeline, it's pretty clear that Gazprom will need the European export market, which goes through a, an already depreciated asset in that transit system, to, to continue to burgeon its cash flows. And without that, Gazprom is going to be in pretty dire straits. So in that respect, I'll say that gas is being used for geopolitical purposes. Um, that's not the only reason why it's being used, because there are commercial differences that are at stake as well. Um, but, but in terms of Europe's fear of it being used as a weapon, uh, the conflict would have to become pretty extreme for that to happen, I think. Yeah. And sorry, just to, to, to pick up on your point about the, um, uh, the pipeline to China, and just to, to uh, pick up on Trevor's point, you're saying about this being a kind of a sign of weakness rather than strength. Is that because, what, the price is, is inherently unfavorable to Russia? They, they've cut what, a bad deal for them? I mean, they had previously, uh, in, uh, the preferred supply field was Western Siberia for the past decade and a half, and that was because it would give them negotiating leverage with the Europeans if there was an alternative destination for that gas, and the economics of that were just a disaster, have been a disaster, because it's a longer pipeline you're selling right into the part of the cheapest and most oversupplied uh, domestic Chinese gas market in Xinjiang. Uh, and now being supplied out of eastern Siberia. It, that alone is a concession on the Russian side. The pricing is a concession on the Russian side. Uh, and to me, reflects a desire to, over the long term, diversify markets so that there are options if, uh, if the European market changes. Ambassador Pasquale, your thoughts on, on Russia? Uh, I, I think the critical thing we've got to remind ourselves is that gas is a tiny substory in this picture, right? Um, Russia has annexed the territory of a neighbor, first time that that's happened in Europe since World War II. Um, it directly sparked an insurgency by in injecting special forces into Ukraine. When that didn't work, it transferred military equipment, which resulted in the downing of a commercial airliner. When the Ukrainian military started gaining an upper hand on the separatists, Russia inter intervened directly with Russian troops and Russian military equipment, including airborne troops, which are the best trained in Russia, which resulted in a massive conflict in which over 3,000 people have been killed since the beginning of August. Okay, so th there is a war, and there, in the course of doing this, Russia has um, shattered the effectiveness of the UN Security Council because of its veto, so the main mechanism of global governance for utilizing a control over a situation like this has been made irrelevant. It's made the OSCE largely irrelevant because it operates by consensus, and so every time the OSCE has sought to inject a significant number of observers, especially into Crimea, for example, in the early days, Russia blocked that occurring. And so it's in this context that this issue of gas plays out. Um, it's, you know, to think of gas as the starting point of the discussion will get you to not very sensible solutions because gas isn't what is the critical factor through which the Russia is analyzing these issues. Um, if we go back to the um, Russia's decision to cut off um, supplies of gas to Ukraine, you have to go back to June 16th and the proposal that the European Union had put on the table between Russia and Ukraine, in which price was more or less within a realm that was reasonable to both sides. Um, Russia claimed issues on debt, but in reality, the Ukrainians had just paid $750 million. A billion dollars would have been paid the next day, and there was a schedule for the repayment of the rest over the following three weeks. 
And what was the real issue is the nature of the contract, which would have required Russia and Ukraine to enter a mutually binding contract that was not simply based on a Russian price that was given to Ukraine with unilateral discounts on the part of Russia, because the last time those unilateral discounts were given, it was for the Black Sea Fleet in Crimea, and now Russia took Crimea and said, we no longer need to give that discount, right? And so, and the reason that became so sensitive is that all of Russia's contracts and Central Europe are negotiated on that basis. Relatively high price with unilateral discounts, it would have created a precedent to have to renegotiate those contracts. And so that becomes the context where you have to look at this. And then we have to ask, well, why was it that Russia over the past two weeks or so have significantly reduced gas supplies into Europe? Um, is it because um, Russia is indeed building up its own stores for the winter period, or is it sending a message to Europe that we're doing this right now when there are adequate supplies, but you know, if you're still trying to help Ukraine in the winter period, then understand what the pressures may be. So um, there's definitely a political game, and gas is a small piece of the political and security game which is being played. What the end point is, it's hard to predict. The EU will host negotiations next week between Russia and Ukraine. We'll see if there is a greater prospect for the sides to start to come together. Thank you. I, I mean, I, I, don't, um, I don't, so much has been said, I'm not sure how much to add. The, I guess the only comment I would make is I think the point Carlos just made r reminds us how difficult a challenge this is to, to get at because uh, you don't want to cut off gas supply because you're dependent on it. It's also a, relatively, as we showed, a small share, so it's l relatively little leverage potentially. Um, oil is the bigger thing, but you can't cut off, you know, 10 million barrels a day of supply to the global market either. And so this really is a tougher challenge than U.S. sanctions against Iran, which pulled a million, a million and a half barrels a day of supply off the market, did impose significant economic pain on Iran, and we've yet to see whether that'll lead to an outcome in the P5 plus one negotiations. Uh, but that's just not something the, that that uh, consumer countries are, are ready to sign up for, uh, given what it would mean for the global oil market. So you're trying to put sanctions in place that say, well, technology and services for Arctic and offshore and uh, tight oil uh, is, is restricted, so we're keeping the supply on the market today, but we're imposing pain by restricting their ability to maintain and grow production in the future. And it's a really hard needle to thread to figure out how do you actually apply some pressure uh, to say, we strongly disapprove of all the actions Carlos just described, Russia is undertaking taken, uh, but do it in a way that doesn't sort of shoot consumer nations and shoot, them in, shoot yourself in the foot economically. Thanks very much. I, um, and I want to come back to the issue of, uh, of sanctions perhaps in a little bit more detail later on, but um, for now I just wanted to think a bit about um, US LNG exports and, and the implication of those. So hearing the situation as you've all been describing it, um, <coughs> the one thing we can be pretty confident of is it's a volatile, unpredictable situation. There are significant risks and certainly risks of uh, what is already a very serious conflict getting worse. Um, as, even as you, if, as you say, the kind of the gas section of that is a relatively kind of minor part in some senses of what, uh, uh, of what it's about. It's still potentially going to be a very important part to a lot of people in Europe if uh, indeed some of the, the kind of the worst uh, situa situations do evolve. In that case, I want to go back to, again, something else Ed Davey said. He said, what did he say? He said, I'm not going to say, please come to our rescue, which obviously, <laughs> presumably, the reason he didn't want to say that is because he's thinking, please come to our rescue. So, and, I mean, no doubt everyone will have, will have read and, and digested this uh, excellent report published today from, from the center, but written by uh, Jason and Trevor, about really exactly that question of, of can the US come to the rescue of Europe through LNG exports? But I wonder if perhaps, you know, you could sort of summarize and pick up a couple of the key points. I don't know, Jason or Trevor, do you want to uh, come in and just kind of explain what your conclusions were? Well, I had a chance to sort of summarize them earlier, so maybe you want to. Yeah, I mean, I'm not so yeah. different than what Jason said yeah, in, the, in the outset, which is that, you know, certainly if we're thinking about solution to the crisis that is unfolding now over a couple of years, uh, just because of the time lag to build export capacity uh, uh, for LNG, uh, that's irrelevant. It's also right now in the market today, the crude export ban is not uh, reducing the pace of production. If there's a debate over when that could occur, but if we completely lifted the crude export ban today and we're free to export crude, uh, oil prices would not be materially different than they are uh, right now. So, uh, so that was the kind of first 
myth that we wanted to dispel with this uh, report was that decisions we make about U.S. LNG will have any bearing on events in Ukraine and Russia over the next uh, year or two. Uh, if we look forward to kind of 2020 to 2025 when those volumes could come online, I mean, I think the kind of headline was, that we found was uh, Europe will still probably buy a lot of Russian gas. Uh, U.S. LNG will make that gas quite a bit cheaper. It'll cost Gazprom uh, a fair amount of money. Uh, it'll give Europeans more options, right? Uh, but, you know, if you look at it relative to the Russian economy as a whole or even just export revenue, the impact is going to be fairly modest. And when you look at the <coughs> sanctions literature and you think about the, the degree of economic pain that is required for a significant change in foreign policy that we didn't see LNG exports specifically as, as, as being able to deliver that level of pain. And, and so again, um, uh, David talked about um, sending a signal to Russia, you know, whatever the kind of the consequences uh, are in terms of uh, the effect of US LNG exports on the European market, uh, they will, these exports will send a signal to Russia. Do, I mean, I mean, Professor Fry, do you believe that, do they send a signal to Russia? And if so, what signal do they send? Well, I'm, I'm, I can leave the an, an analysis of the, uh, the, the global energy market to, uh, uh, to the experts. But it's clear that, that Russia was very late to the party on shale gas, and they're very nervous about uh, the, the, the long term the longer term consequences of this for a long time. Even Vladimir Putin at one time was <coughs> criticizing the environmental impact of shale gas, the, the, great, uh, the great green in the Kremlin. Uh, 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 uh. But they're, they're very, late, very late to this party. And although Russia does have significant reserves of shale gas that eventually they will be able uh, to tap into, that's not, if, that's not coming online uh, uh, any, any time soon at all. Um, if, if I could just add a couple of things on this. Um, the, the critical factor which um, LNG has started to introduce in the European relationship with Russia on gas is competition. Right? And the, the key theme here, and I think it's highlighted well in your paper, and I commend you for that, is the importance of, of advancing those competitive threats. And already, the production of gas in the United States, as just Jason highlighted in that final slide, has had an impact on this market because of the redirection of supplies from, from Qatar, from Trinidad and Tobago. And if you look at 2011 and 2012, a combination of gas supplies being redirected, greater LNG import capacity, investments in infrastructure to be able to more effectively move around gas in the European market, the implementation, as Ed Davies said, of the third energy package, which doesn't let a company own the gas, own the pipeline, and own the distribution system, so you've had internal competition. All, right, all of those things you got to look at together, not just, if you just look at LNG exports without that other stuff, you don't get the right answer. If you look at the whole as a package, what it tells you is that there's already been a move toward greater competition in this market. And that competition resulted in 2011, 2012, something really dramatic that just you couldn't have imagined a decade before is that Western European utilities renegotiated their contracts with Gazprom to lower the prices and improve the financing terms. And the reason they did it was with market power. And in 2012, who was the largest supplier of gas to, to Europe? It wasn't Gazprom, it was Statoil. Okay, and the reason those things changed was because of the dynamism in the market. So it doesn't mean that Gazprom is going to become irrelevant, it doesn't mean it's not going to become a supplier, but when Gazprom knows that it has to operate in this market in the context of competition with others, and when it has an investment of 220 billion cubic meters of pipeline capacity to Europe, and your alternative for the next decade is 14 billion cubic meters of LNG to out of Sakhalin to Asia, and a contract for 38 BCM to China, which will take another decade to, to put it into place, then, you know, it kind of puts things into a little bit of perspective. It's not that the U.S. supplies of LNG are going to save the day, but they're going to reinforce this environment of competition in a global market that keeps Gazprom from being able to assume that it can operate in a monopoly environment. And that's a big deal. Um, 
So yeah, I, if, if I can chime in here, I, I think that it's important for everyone to keep in mind that implicit in, in some, of, uh, some of these comments is when we discuss competition, we, we have to think through the idea that we're seeing competition between hub traded gas, which is what we're more used to happening here in the US and, uh, and Canada as well, and legacy oil index long-term supply contracts. And, and that's the, the competition that we're talking about in a renegotiation that's lowered the price of this gas from Russia to a lot of these uh, large utilities in Europe. But I, I think that it's also important that we recognize that through all this rhetoric, it sounds as though Europe, at least hub-traded Europe, is in an environment right now where you have cheap gas. And oil index gas is expensive gas. And because of that, you have this renegotiation. Well, it's true that oil index gas, or at least these legacy formulas, are significantly higher than where the hubs are trading. But the hubs are actually pretty expensive relative to not just what we see in the US, but what we saw in Europe until very, very recently. Um, we're, we're seeing quite expensive hub gas. And the reason for this disconnect between oil index gas and spot traded gas is because oil prices rebounded after the financial crisis and stayed up in the triple digits. So it's not as though we're seeing a renegotiation to cheap levels. We're actually seeing very strong prices even after these renegotiations. And I do want to point out one other thing uh, that, that hopefully I'll get across clearly in a way that mo won't make me sound like an apologist for a large exporter of natural gas. But it's not just the volume of gas that's important. And, and we, we saw a lot of graphs that Jason presented earlier that show the degree to which Russia will remain very closely uh, aligned or integrated with the European market. But it's not just the volume that's important. I think that what we have to keep in mind is that Russia provides a huge amount of flexibility to the European gas system. Russian exports to Europe actually go up by about 50% from the summer into the winter when it's needed most. And so when we talk about flexibility, you have to actually think, keep in mind that there is a price to that flexibility. And having a long-term contract where there is a, somewhat of a premium that's put in place for flexibility is perfectly normal. Having it indexed to an oil market, which has no relationship to the gas market, well, that's not uh, the most natural system. Uh, I hope, and I hope that's not too much of a pun. <laughs> sure. and, and how do you see it evolving then? I mean, do, do you think that we are going to see kind of more intense competition? Are we going to get another round of renegotiations? I mean, when you, uh, you know, when the EDF thinks about this as a, as a large gas buyer, is it thinking, fantastic, this is going to be another chance for us to turn the screws on Gazprom a bit more? Well, I can't comment on, uh, <laughs> on, on any uh, relationships that the parent company yeah. has. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, I, I don't know what the, the phrase was that Minister Davy used, diplomacy is uh, urging me to move along. But, yeah. but what, what I will say is that different actors within Europe will, do have um, different affinities for oil index gas and for, for hub index gas. And a lot of that depends on where those utilities are located and what their downstream commitments are. Uh, not to digress too much, but another reason for this urge to renegotiate has not just been the disconnect in prices, but it's been a policy push along those lines. And we, we saw it most dramatically in Germany in 2006, where a court effectively created a disconnect between the downstream contracts of a lot of these midstream companies, uh, saying that a large purchaser of gas could have the option to exit that contract after two years or after four years, depending on how much gas that was. That created a disconnect for, for a company like Eon or RWE that had a 20 or 30 year supply contract going upstream. More recently, we've seen both France and Italy move so that regulated tariffs are more closely aligned with hubs than with oil index prices. So there's a policy push for that, and that policy push is going to drive a lot of the preferences for these companies that buy from places like Russia. I'm just gonna say, I think, I mean, listening to Teddy, I mean, it is making me ask the question, I'm, I'm curious what other people think about, so Europe gets, Europe drives benefit. It's a, as mutual dependence, right? Russia, Europe gets the gas that it needs. It's relatively inexpensive. It can get uh, supplies, seasonal supplies uh, when it needs. 
Um, and the question then is what energy security means for Europe, because with all those benefits of this affordable and flexible supply of gas they're getting uh, from Russia comes the ability, as we've seen Russia do just in the last few weeks, to decide we're going to cut off supply uh, when we want to, you know, send a message. And so I think that's the challenge we're struggling with, and that's what we tried to sort of talk about a little bit in the report. Look, three-quarters of Europe's LNG import capacity is unused right now. The problem is if you brought anything into it, you couldn't get it to most of the places where you need to get it to. And so this was kind of, I think, what Minister Davy was getting at about how do we think about the role of the private sector, how do we think about government uh, uh, paying for some of this stuff. Is that, the is that a right way to think about the role of government to build out infrastructure, reversals, uh, uh, interconnectors uh, that, you know, may not be used on a regular basis. Do we need to think more seriously, as the Europeans have started to do, about strategic gas storage reserves, the way we have for uh, petroleum and for product? Um, I think the security measures to deal with temporary disruptions that sort of remove the ability of Russia to use cutting off supply as leverage or as a weapon is, I think, where you want to focus. It's not obvious to me what the question, what the answer is, but I think there are several low-cost steps you can take to try to, you know, to try to get there and improve that. I know Carlos spent a lot of time when he was at the State Department until he left a month or two ago working on some of those. And, and uh, I mean, I suppose the other thing, as you say, when you talk about the, that amount of uh, LNG import capacity being unused, even though, today, as you put it, you know, hub gas prices are actually relatively high in Europe by historical standards, is they're even higher in Asia. And then, so that's the kind of... Um, you know, that, that, that's the dynamic, that, that's the, um, the kind of the gravitational pull of, uh, of where kind of spare LNG tends to go. Um, does that make a difference to the calculation? I mean, well, I could put this another way, is essentially what we're going to end up with is, being, is going to be kind of a global liquid uh, gas market, a liquid, uh, again, to, if you'll excuse the pun, a liquid LNG market, um, where we see some kind of equalization of, of gas prices around the world. Look, I, I, the market is, as you're saying, it's, it's literally and figuratively becoming more liquid. And, um, and when, we review, when we look at this, we have to look at it not just from a perspective of U.S. supplies into that market. Today, the largest exporter of LNG in the world is Qatar, the, somewhere between 100 and 110 billion cubic meters a year. In the next decade, between the United States, Canada, and Australia, we're going to add three more Qatars. All right? Mozambique, which has had the largest gas finds in the world um, in the last 30 years, will come online somewhere around 2020. Tanzania has had significant gas finds. On the west coast of Africa, if Nigeria and Angola can get governance issues in line, um, they have tremendous supplies of gas increased gas fines out of, night, out of uh, Norway. In the Mediterranean, um, not only the traditional suppliers like Algeria, Libya, if they could have peace, but Israel has become a significant supplier of gas. And so this whole, this market is changing. And we don't know what it's gonna look like in a decade. But the message which is coming online is that you can't rely on the tradition of being a monopoly supplier to gauge your market behavior and your pricing, that that world is changing and that options are going to exist. So if you look even at Europe right now, I mean, they're using, they have about 175 billion cubic meters of pipe, of LNG import capacity. They're using about 45 to 50. It's significantly dropped by about 25 in the last couple of years. Why did it drop? Because traders started to make more money of taking LNG and selling it into Asia and making money off of the arbitrage, even if at the time they were paying higher prices for, for gas that was coming out of Russia. That's starting to change around because a lot of suppliers in Asia are actually finding that they actually bought into too much gas, and gas is going to start coming back into the European market. So is it a global market with a unified price? No, it, and the cost of transport is really high. It's really expensive. But there's, there are significant developments in supply that are starting to change the behavior of that market overall and even the nature of the contracts. So, so Timothy Fry, I wanted to think a bit, a bit about what that means for Russia then. I mean, so as we've been hearing, you know, in, terms of, uh, um, in terms of the Russian economy overall, gas export revenues are, are not uh, enormously significant. You know, I mean, they're, not, they're not negligible, but they're not dominant, and that's, that's oil. But for Gazprom, 
it could be very significant. And as we've been hearing, Gazprom's facing kind of new competition in a way it hasn't ever before. And, and sorry, just to get up at the end of that thought, and, you know, we've uh, certainly got used to the idea that the interests of Gazprom are very dear to the heart uh, of the Kremlin and, and Vladimir Putin in particular. And perhaps that's been slightly less so maybe in the past couple of years, but, you know, certainly and until now there's been a very close identification between the interests of Gazprom and the interests of the Russian state. And so I wonder what that means. Yeah, I mean, one interesting question is we talked about the, the economic impacts of Gazprom's, uh, uh, you know, relatively difficult uh, period over the last few years and its difficult future going forward. Um, if we think about Russian politics, yeah, that, I think, is even more uncertain because if we think of Russian politics as Vladimir Putin as the referee among these large uh, financial groups, uh, energy sector, natural resource groups, you know, Gazprom has always been at the heart of that. And to the extent that Rosneft, um, the major state-owned oil company, has re kind of in some sense replaced uh, uh, Gazprom as the, the most favored uh, uh, sister within the uh, within the, the the Kremlin, I think, does inject a lot of uncertainty um, into how we think about you know what Russian politics are going to be uh, going forward. And I, I've been I'm a political scientist. I've been studying mm. Russia for a long time, and I don't remember a time um, since 1985 when I started studying Russian politics where people feel greater uncertainty about how decisions are being made within the Kremlin. I mean, if we think even in the Gorbachev period, there was a very, it was a very leaky house, right? You could always get someone to tell you kind of, you know, what, the, what was going on within the Politburo. Uh, uh, in, the, in the 1990s, in the Yeltsin period, you know, politics was much more an open book. And even over the last, uh, you know, even in the Putin's first two terms and, and into uh, uh, the Medvedev era, um, you know, we had, a, we had a pretty good sense of who the important players were, how decisions were being made, how information was flowing. And over the last 18 months, I, I think we have very little idea of, of what's going on. You know, reportedly decisions are being made by a much smaller and smaller uh, uh, number of individuals. And, uh, uh, you know, the minister was right to say, uh, you know, unless you're, you know, uh, unless you have a bug uh, on one of these uh, individuals, you really don't have a great idea. And even then, you know, there, there's lots of opacity in how decisions are being made. There's lots of backstabbing that goes on at, at, at these very high levels. So I think... You know, that level of uncertainty is, is really, I think, what worries, uh, what worries a lot of us. We've talked a little bit about uh, sanctions uh, this afternoon. How do you read the impact of sanctions, perhaps particularly on the well, energy sector? I mean, my other hat is I'm a political scientist, not just somebody who watches Russia. And if you think about the, the, the sanctions literature, um, it tells you that sanctions tend not to be effective, particularly when they're used against, you know, larger countries or where they require lots of international uh, uh, cooperation, um, when, uh, when issues are very uh, important uh, uh, for the, the target country, it's very difficult for them, uh, uh, for sanctions to move countries away from uh, taking positions that are very dear to them. On the other hand, um, you know, the, the Russian economy is very concentrated in, uh, uh, in, uh, in energy and natural resources. The, the financial sector, which is really the Achilles heel, is dominated by two large state-owned banks that work in a very uh, opaque way and still owe, uh, I think, in the next year or two, owe between $100 billion and $200 billion to the West. Russian corporates are, are, have very high levels of debt uh, to the West, up to around half a trillion dollars over the next couple of years. So the, 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 um, Russia is vulnerable. On the other hand, there's also tremendous uncertainty here because if we think about sanctions on, on Iran, which is sometimes put forward as a, as a positive case, well, Russia, Iran's economy is, what, $100, $100 billion? Russia's $2.2 trillion. Right? This is, you know, usually sanctions work against the Sudans. You, know, you levy them against the Cubas, the North Koreas, not you know, countries that are integrated into the global economy, that have nuclear weapons. Uh, and that have very large economies and very large internal markets as well. So, um, uh, so it's kind of a long-winded way of saying uh, uh, sanctions could work, but we have to be realistic about what the expectations are. The same way that there's been hype around shale gas being the silver bullet, there's also, I think, some hype around sanctions being the silver, silver bullet as well. We need to take that into account. Anyone else want to come in on the, the sanctions issue? And what, um, I, I guess I, I would just uh, add that um, when um, 
you, you've had the kind of political developments and security developments um, that we've seen between Russia and Ukraine and um, uh, the, not only the incursion onto a neighbor's territory but the annexation of that neighbor, a portion of that neighbor. Uh, the issue is how do you respond and what are the implications globally for the rule of law. And if you take a military card off of the table, then what are you left with? And so sanctions, are, they're not a panacea. They're a, a way of trying to invoke a price and a cost. And Jason outlined very well earlier the intent to try to structure sanctions in a way that they had an impact on perceptions of the future of the industry, especially an industry which is so critical to the Russian economy. And as a result of that, having an impact on the ability to finance a budget deficit, finance company debt, refinance debt. Um, but I think one of the things that you have to come back to and remember is uh, just ask the question, why might it be that Russia now has been more willing to engage in the negotiation and support the negotiation of a ceasefire agreement in the East? And I, I would speculate that the reason for that is that hundreds of dead young Russian kids are coming back to Russia. Um, as a result of that conflict, and that's starting to have a real serious political impact. And if you put sanctions in that context where the big driver is the security and political implications of being in a war where dead Russian kids are starting to come back into the country, and on top of that there are sanctions, can it be a factor that has an impact on political and economic perceptions possibly? If it was just sanctions and you, you simply looked at that only as what's going to change the situation, um, it, it's, a tough, it's a tough hill to climb. Um, it's, one that you've got, it's something you've got to do because of the need to impose a cost. But if you look at this more broadly in the context of how this could work in the context of a changing security situation, perhaps those sanctions might be complementary to other things that are happening. Just a couple of points on that. Not to send sanctions. Uh, or not to deliver sanctions, I think would have sent uh, you know a very different message. Um, uh, so sometimes people will criticize sanctions and say, well, wh what's the alternative? And if the alternative is putting boots on the ground, that's also not an option. I think a lot of people are very uh, excited about or uh, not delivering sanctions. Sanctions look 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 pretty uh, uh, pretty attractive. So. The one thing I'd flag on that, I mean, it's as, as, as uh, Ambassador Pasqual says, I mean, it kind of becomes the default option when the military card's not on the table, and we're in using it with increasing frequency. And the U.S. is in a somewhat unique position in our ability to exert extraterritorial power based on our unique role in the global financial system, and in the kind of interest of, you know, giving Jason other things to research uh, at, the, uh, at the center. I think we haven't really thought through what, as, as the rest of the world gets adjusted to, okay, this is a tool the U.S. is going to use again and again the prospect that that actually changes the way other countries engage in, uh, in, in the finance system. So there's a five-page research proposal I was reviewing this morning. <laughs> and, and so one of the next projects we're going to take on very seriously uh, is a long project looking at energy sanctions because sanctions both through the Obama administration and Bush before them in the last decade I think have been used in really new and innovative ways. The Treasury Department with State and uh, Commerce and others has tried to do new and innovative things, tried to target sanctions in particular ways. You think of sanctions as this economy is off limits or the supply of oil is cut off and we're trying to really thread needles as I said before in really new ways and I think going back and saying here first let's remind people what's actually been done because it's somewhat technical and somewhat complex let's remind people of what the policy goal in doing those things was for example not disrupt current markets but impose pain in the future um, and then I think we're actually well positioned to pull together so many people from industry, from financial markets, from investment firms here in New York with academics uh, and with government people to draw some lessons about <clears throat> how policymakers should think about applying sanctions in the future. So that will be another event we'll have at some point. I think that in this case, if we're trying to think through the message that sanctions are delivering, I don't think that we can overlook the, the message that the sanctions are <coughs> delivering to Ukraine rather than to Russia. In particular, Europe is quite frightened that the flow of gas going through Ukraine will be disrupted at any point. And Ukraine has needed to see effectively three things uh, from the Europeans and from the rest of the West to encourage them to continue to pass the gas through into Europe. Now, one of them clearly has been a financial rescue package that 
has started to, you know, try to put a floor under the, the depression that Ukraine is going through. Another one is to try to show that it's imposing some cost on Russia for the actions that are taking place in eastern Ukraine. And then the third uh, piece of that is to actually physically flow gas back into Ukraine from the west and from the north. And in, in that regard, sanctions are actually helping to maintain the flow of gas through Ukraine into the rest of Europe and helping to maintain the uh, security of supply in that regard. Thank you. And, and actually, in that context, um, what's, what's your view of the pipeline projects that bypass Ukraine? You know, when, when obviously you know, Nord Stream got built, South Stream now <coughs> sort of up in the air. Is it now absolutely inconceivable <laughs> that Europe could go ahead with, with South Stream now? I mean, and you know, that would presumably send exactly the opposite of the message you were talking about in terms of the EU's relations with Ukraine. Anyone, I would, for you or anyone else, want to come in on that? Well, I'll start because I will move along quite quickly as EDF is a 15% shareholder in South Stream. So, <laughs> so, so, oh, so yeah. in that regard, that's true. But, but I think that there are certain things in, in the much nearer term that are worth looking at. So, for example, uh, you know, one of the things I, I, I love about these glossy reports that come out that the center has provided are, are the wonderful graphs and the maps. In this one, and I think that there's a map of the pipeline system on page 36, if I'm not mistaken, and you'll see a little dashed blue line that, that's called Opal, and it, it looks like it's a pro proposed pipeline, but it's actually a pipeline that exists right now, and it's flowing, but it's only flowing at half capacity, and because it's only flowing at half capacity, Russia can only use Nord Stream to a, to a limited degree. It can't quite flow all of the gas that it could flow through Nord Stream directly into Northwest Europe, and it, all it would take is a single and very simple policy pronouncement by the EU that would allow Gazprom to flow through Opal at full capacity. And that decision has been continuously put off, probably for political reasons, given what's happening. But if there is a disruption of gas going through Ukraine into Europe, that's a big question. Will Europe continue to limit the amount of gas that Gaz Gazprom can export into Europe but, uh, through other transit routes? Other thoughts on that? What you? I, I think, first of all, it's just it's important to remember that Ukraine has not cut off any gas supplies going um, through Ukraine into Europe. Um, it's been a consistent supplier. It's made no attempts to actually disrupt that gas. And it recognizes that in this circumstance, Europe is its best friend. Um, if uh, Ukraine cuts off those gas supplies, reverse flows disappear. It's simply not going to happen because the gas isn't going to be there. Um, as you said, the financial support um, through um, Europe and from the IMF and probably from the United States are going to disappear because you're not going to have the consensus to maintain the international financial assistance that's necessary. I think that at, this is a point in time when the risk of Ukraine cutting off gas supplies um, from Russia to Europe are actually quite low. If you look at, if you just simply do the math on the compression of demand in Ukraine because of the war, um, the increased amounts that are now available through reverse flows, which have increased quite significantly over the past year, um, the amount which Ukraine has in storage, um, the risk of Ukraine cutting off gas supply um, into the European market is also very low. And so I, I, we, I think we just need to put that on the table and start stop speculating that this is something which is around the corner because the, the prospect of it is, I, I think, very, very low. What we do know is true is that Russia has actually reduced its supply of gas to Poland, to Germany, to Austria, to Romania, um, at a point in time when those countries were requesting additional flows. Um, so that, that is an established point. Now, on, on South Stream, um, here's a situation that one has to assess commercially. Right? There are 220 billion cubic meters worth of pipeline capacity built from Russia into Europe. Right now, about 160 billion cubic meters of that are being used, about half of that through Ukraine. And so the proposal with South Stream is, depending on whether you're adding two pipelines or four, to spend, and here the amounts are completely not transparent, um, but let's just say somewhere in the range of 20 to $40 billion, which in the end a consumer is going to have to pay for. Does it make sense to make that investment at a point in time when there's already excess pipeline capacity when 
the pipeline capacity that Russia needs to build is actually to the Asian market. And if you were looking at this strictly on commercial terms, you would say it actually makes no sense. What is the case right now is that the European Union has said that the intergovernmental agreements that have been negotiated in the southern part of the route do not comply with the European <coughs> Union's rules. And until that changed, the European Union is not going to consider the pipeline. Thank you. As, as you say, it doesn't make sense in commercial terms. Presumably makes sense in non-commercial terms, I guess, is that. But yeah. Um, so I had, I had a question from the floor, which I uh, actually is something I was going to be asking anyway, so I'm very glad to have got it, which is what are the kind of um, uh, the risks around the outlook for, for U.S. LNG exports? And I'm interested in, in everyone's uh, views really on this. So the, this, this, um, the question specifically picks up on um, EPA plans for um, uh, cutting uh, carbon dioxide emissions, which you know, look like they will favor gas-fired generation in, instead of coal. Um, so it's likely then that we're going to see an increase in <coughs> gas demand in the U.S. Obviously, there's a lot of, you know, new petrochemical facilities going in. People are talking about gas for transport, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of, lot of um, more uses of gas that are being found here. And at the same time, um, there's still, I think it's fair to say, some uncertainty about the outlook for supply, given that, you know, given if, if only that... Shale gas is only 10 years old. We still just haven't had that much of a record in terms of, you know, long-term well performance, in terms of uh, exploration of all the shale areas and so on, in order to be able to be absolutely confident about what the uh, the kind of you know, the medium-term supply outlook is going to look like. So I'm interested, really, in in kind of all your thoughts on on how you kind of think about that when you think about, you know, what the volumes of U.S. Uh, LNG exports will be, um, you know, and and how uh, far. Uh, U.S. LNG will be able to find a market, what are the things that people should be thinking about and what are your expectations for those kind of key factors? Um, perhaps, sorry, Jason, you want to, or, you want to start uh, I, I, so, yeah. uh, We've done some, uh, at Rhodium Group, have done some modeling on the impact of the EPA's 111D proposals on U.S. gas demand, and a lot depends on how the final rule that comes out next June looks and then, more importantly, how states decide to comply but, you know, likely translates into somewhere between 3 and 10 BCF a day of additional gas demand in the power sector between uh, 2020 and 2025, right, when many of those terminals are coming online. Now, we've done some modeling of kind of aggressive power sector gas demand scenarios from 111D in the presence of 9 BCF a day of U.S. LNG exports, in the presence of 18 BCF a day of LNG exports, and provided that uh, the industry maintains its social license to operate at the rate that it's currently operating, best available estimates are that the resource is there to supply at a modest increase in cost those various sources of demand. So, so what does modest increase in cost mean? Give or take, what, what's the Henry Hub? You that? know, it's a, depend, the, if you have simultaneously 9 BCF a day of LNG demand and 10 BCF a day you know, buck, a buck fifty, Henry Hub, above where you would be right. otherwise, right? So, you know, you're still well below where Henry Hub prices used to be. Now, depends on what your baseline is. If you're at five before that happens and that buck, buck fifty puts you to six and a half, then, you know, delivered into Asia, I mean, this is really where the rubber meets the road or the yeah. kind of marginal cost of U.S. supply versus the pricing around the world. And there will be a point where those supply and demand curves cross and incremental U.S. projects aren't viable. And that's why industry kind of puts it currently at 9, 8, 9, 10 BCF a day, because at some point we won't be cost competitive, right? Um, but, the, uh, but, but I think that it's important to kind of emphasize if you're, a, if you're a Japanese buyer, right, that if the industry maintains its social license to operate is an important if that you have to hedge against in thinking about how much of your portfolio do you want to be Henry Hub linked. We have a lot of conversation about the kind of merits of gas hub pricing versus oil hub pricing. You know, there is, there's no intrinsic cost benefit in one index versus the other index, right? I mean, I could index my gas to pork bellies if I wanted, and when I negotiate the contract, I'm going to link it at the point where the buyer and the seller agree that it makes sense, right? Uh, it depends a lot on the volatility of that index and your outlook for it. And if you think that all else equal Henry Hub prices are going to rise, and you think all else equal crude prices are going to fall, then it's not immediately clear that a hub-linked price will be cheaper for you at the end of the day. Now, if you're a Japanese buyer that's right now getting 100% of your gas oil-linked, 
just for diversification sense. It makes sense to get some Henry Hub gas, maybe 20% of your portfolio. But looking at the not so unvolatile history of Henry Hub prices in the US, I think that that's, a, that's an important factor for buyers to keep in mind. Yeah. Not so unvolatile. That's an important concept we'll have to uh, keep in mind. Sorry, Jason. No, well, that's an important point, the assumption that oil index means high gas prices and hub price means low gas prices. And we're going to see lots of important changes in the global LNG market over the next decade. And you know, we'll see if those uh, relationships hold, hold true. There might be a little bit of be careful what you wish for element in some of the Asian uh, gas price contracts that are getting signed. I just want to point out the good news. The good news is you just said, what are the risks to US LNG exports? And then you gave some examples like supply or EPA rules and you didn't say, are the DOE permits going to be forthcoming? Well, so, do you know what? As soon as, as I someone, spoke and I kicked myself and I thought, that's the other thing uh, I should have mentioned. But no, because I go to lots of things where the administration gets criticized, so let's give credit where credit's due. Uh, for the most part, not entirely, there's still a permitting requirement by law, uh, but for the most part, most part, people recognize that that's not much of a risk anymore. Uh, the Department of Energy recently changed its process in important ways to actually remove the requirement that you uh, obtain conditional approval in the first place. You go through the FERC process now, which takes time, it's costly, but it's predictable. You know what you need to do to get through it. Uh, and then at least up to 12 BCF a day, uh, probably further, uh, the Department of Energy has signaled you will uh, get a, a permit to export gas, and we're seeing investment flow, we're seeing projects get built now. So I don't think that's a risk. Uh, there is a, you know, I, I think the more information we get about the supply of gas in the US, the more reason there is to think that we have a not entirely flat supply curve, but uh, we have a lot of relatively inexpensive gas. I think the supply uh, can keep pace with rising demand, new sources of demand for exports uh, and for other things. Um, one thing just to, I think, bear in mind, and we talk about it in the report, is you know, this question, a lot of people say it's sort of a self-limiting principle, right? If U.S. gas prices get pushed up too much, then the arbitrage window closes, you can't pay six or seven dollars to get it overseas, so no one will want the gas anymore. And we sort of spend some time in there actually talking about the nature, the structure of U.S. gas contracts. Because if you look, for example, at the Chenier contract at Sabine Pass, uh, which is a take or pay contract with a... Uh, 115% uh, of Henry Hub plus a $3 roughly tolling fee, a little more, a little less, um, that you pay whether you take the gas or not. So that changes the way a buyer of gas thinks about uh, the calculation that they're making if they're deciding whether to, Korean utility is deciding whether to you know, take it from one source versus take it from the US and they measure what the cost of those two things are, they're gonna add on to the alternative source roughly $3 because they have to pay that no matter what. So actually that arbitrage can close a little bit more than people think, uh, although you know, that may be different. Uh, the calculation may be different, let's say, for an intermediary because a lot of that gas is being sold to BG and some others that'll just play in the market. Uh, they might not take that into consideration the same way an end user utility would, but I think that's an important thing to remember. Um, just two things real quick to add to this picture is that the life cycle costs of the production of shale gas in the United States have dropped radically. Um, in 2011, people used to estimate $5, $5.25. Um, then it dropped to about 450. Now we're increasingly seeing prices uh, uh, around 250, 225, um, depending on the field structures. Um, and that increased efficiency, the application of technology, of information systems to the fracking process, have really driven down the cost quite significantly. Um, the other thing to remember in this issue of competition and markets is that for markets to function, you have to have the infrastructure for a market. So in Europe, you had investments in LNG regasification terminals and pipelines, um, changes in regulatory structure, um, a whole series of measures that were taken, for example, of eliminating destination clauses, uh, third party access to pipelines. You don't have that for the most part in Asia still. There's still a shortage of regasification terminals. There's still a shortage of re interconnecting pipelines. There's still a shortage of um, tankers to be able to move the gas. Um, there's, there, you know, in comparison to the EU where you had one regulatory entity that was acting on the behalf of a market of 400 million people, um, in Asia you have multiple countries with many different views. And so it, it's, some of the critical requirements for creation of that global market still have to emerge in the Asian marketplace. In the end, um, what we've seen in Europe over the past five years is that they've gone from a market that was 
about 70 to 80 percent oil index to now about 50. Nobody regulated that or nobody decreed it. It happened because competition in market terms took it in that direction. And I suspect that eventually what we're going to see in Asia is that market competition is going to actually drive the structure of contracts. But in the short term, what you're getting in Asia is that at times when you've gotten big pressure on, on hub trade, it's actually pushed the price further up because the market is so thin, the infrastructure for trade is so limited that it actually pushes prices up higher when you get more competition. Right? So these things are still evolving. And, and the, the one thing we can say with a lot of certainty is that the nature of these markets is going to be really different in a decade. But exactly what the various pieces are going to be, that, that's still in an evolutionary stage. And I just want to quickly mention one other risk, because Trevor mentioned social licensed operate. And, and we should remember it. It's a real issue. Where there's a shale revolution happening in the US. I think it will continue. But you know, I think industry's got to get this right. I think regulators have to get this right. The concerns over methane leakage and whether you're really getting climate benefits, uh, concerns about earthquake activity in places like Oklahoma. I mean, these are legitimate concerns that we need to understand better. We need to make sure the right regulations are in place to make sure this all happens safely. I think that we can get there. There's no reason we should be able to, but, but it doesn't happen on its own. So, I mean, I, I have to say I was very struck yesterday when I was out uh, watching the climate march. I, I have to say I was watching rather than participating, but as no doubt we were all there in one capacity or another. The thing I, that really struck me was how many signs there were about fracking. The, the, you know, I would say there were more signs about fracking than anything else. I think arguably there were more signs uh, against fracking than there were against climate change, which is quite a striking kind of, kind of conclusion. And, and as you say, it does just kind of raise that issue about still there's a kind of a you know, uh, a and deep that's with of millions of wells drilled and almost you know no major environmental incidents. So you can imagine you have that yeah. level of, of of passion about that issue absent a major incident, yeah. right? And that's where I think that if not to talk about what the kind of right regulation is or not in the U.S., but as a buyer, and if you were thinking about price risk in the U.S. market, you know. Gaming out a scenario where political <laughs> attitudes about fracking in the U.S. change is certainly a scenario you would include in, uh, in forecasting possible price trajectories in the U.S. Well, I think we're just about out of time. I wanted very much just to have one uh, kind of final thought from you all um, about European energy security then. And we know if we are in this uh, position where, as we've been uh, discussing, um, U.S. LNG is, is not going to save Europe. It's, it's not the answer to all of Europe's problems, and there certainly is a, a problem as we've been discussing. You know, what are I mean, perhaps just a you know a few thoughts from everyone, or even just one about you know what are the the things Europe could be and should be doing to secure its uh, own energy security? Does anyone want to come in on that? No. Well. I mean yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think I, I, we laid out some of them in the report, so mm. I won't repeat sort of what, what we yeah. said there, but I, I do think it's important to make sure that, uh, <clears throat> that, that, that it, you're resilient in terms of your storage, you have the right infrastructure in place, that you're increasing production and reducing consumption. Ultimately, reducing consumption is, and becoming more energy efficient is a very important way to increase energy security. But you know, I think one of the takeaways from the report was that people talk a lot about getting off Russian gas, uh, and that's probably not going to happen. And as you heard Teddy say, there may be downsides to that as well as upsides. Uh, but the question is, how do you reduce your vulnerability to a disruption in supply? Uh, and I think there are steps that can be taken with infrastructure uh, and, and, and with regulation in terms of moving forward toward a more integrated gas market with some of the antitrust policies that uh, Europe is putting in place uh, that can help make your, to help, help weaken, you know, to make the threat of cutting off supply less of a point of leverage for Russia. Um, uh, I'll acknowledge uh, my class on uh, energy and foreign policy and its geopolitical implications, which is here right now instead of actually being in the classroom. And uh, um, one of the readings for this week was on the Euro European energy security strategy. Um, and I commend it to those who uh, haven't looked at it. It was published in June, reviewed by the European Council and approved by them um, uh, toward the end of June. A lot of these measures that have been discussed are in there. Um, some of the measures that uh, Mr. Davies uh, talked about, including uh, the way to move from 200 and something um, projects of common interest to a handful of those projects and identifying which ones are critical are part of it. Um, a great emphasis on energy efficiency. I think that's one thing everybody agrees to in every single part of the energy world, whether it's environmentalists or um, international oil companies, greater efficiency is a, is a critical measure and how to, how to engender that. 
And then you get into some controversial issues of what does diversification mean? Um, does diversification have more gas and franking and all those political issues that Trevor was just alluding to? What happens with nuclear and how to deal with the tensions between Russia and France on those questions? Um, those are real issues that have to be played out, how to deal with the use of coal. Um, and the fact that you know we've seen over the past four to five years as, Russia, as Germany in particular has shut down its nuclear industry, its use of coal has actually increased. And so um, you know, an irony is you have a, a, a German power system which is, you know, uses an awful lot of renewables and takes all of the new renewables as much as it can, and then it goes from renewables to coal. And it's shutting down all of its gas-fired plants because they're only operating for two or three hours a day, and it couldn't deal with the small amount of time that they were operating. So those are, those are real issues that are being addressed right now. But I think that the overall theme that has really reinforced uh, a movement forward on the European energy security strategy have been, first of all, diversification, looking at how do you get multiple suppliers and multiple products. And as a result of that, how do you get competition? And those two fundamental points are central to, I think, any solutions that are going to have to be put forward and, and whether they're going to be commercially viable over time. Did it go? I think if we're, we're contemplating European energy security, we've already talked about flexibility in terms of pipelines, in terms of storage or regasification facilities. And one other one that we've discussed but haven't brought it out explicitly as an aspect of energy security is that having an appropriate price mechanism actually does create an amount of commercial flexibility in the market that helps to send the proper signals to ration supply and demand. So I don't think, or I would be surprised if anybody up here were to argue that during times of scarcity, prices should not go up. And as the market continues to trend away from oil indexation and toward more of a hub-oriented system, the opportunity for that price signal to be there and to help the market to balance supply and demand, it will actually become greater and greater. Now, if I can take my SEPA hat off for a second and put on my commercial hat, part of that also has to deal with um, what, you know, we talked about liquidity and liquidity in the market. One of the ways for these large companies in Europe to move off of oil index gas and toward hub index gas is to do so within an environment in which they can comfortably hedge their risk going out a reasonable distance into the future. And we've seen in the past several years, in particular since the financial crisis, a drying up of liquidity and a movement of liquidity from the back end of the curve toward the front end of the curve. And what that means is that even if there's a large company that's out there, or a small company that wants to hedge quite a lot of risk going out five or 10 years into the future, sometimes even just three years into the future, the liquidity or the trading partners just simply are not there. And that's making it more difficult for some of these companies to get off of oil index gas toward a more appropriate system of pricing their gas and managing their risk. Interesting thought. Thank you. Trevor. I don't have anything to add. I think everybody else. Can. Yeah, I just want to thank uh, Jason and everyone for bringing us all together and uh, uh, a report that I'd really encourage you to read because it really strikes the right tone between recognize what I think is the promise of, uh, of shale gas but also recognizing some of its limitations. And it, it does a really nice job of using a rigorous methodology but presenting the material in a very, um, in a very accessible <coughs> fashion. So I really urge you um, to, to take it home with you and read it. So let me just say by way of wrap up, first I also want to um, thank uh, Ed Crux uh, for moderating today. I didn't get sort of a proper introduction at the start of the panel. Uh, I won't go through his bio, but for those of us who spend a lot of time talking to reporters, uh, there are a few that you learn more by talking to them than they may learn by talking to you. So I know how much lots of us enjoy talking to Ed and, and his reporting is just first rate. There are a few people in journalism who have a deeper understanding of uh, US and global energy markets than Ed. I want to thank all the panelists uh, for, for, for being here. Uh, I want to thank, uh, again, I mentioned earlier, uh, Matt Robinson at the center for the work he did on the report, Akko Schloj. Particularly want to thank Trevor and his colleagues at the Rhodium Group for the work they did on the research and the modeling for this. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think it's a good example of kind of what we want to do and have been doing at the center. First-rate research, first-rate uh, panel uh, discussions to have uh, um, uh, public dialogue about these things with people like Minister Davey and, and this great uh, panel here. So in the spirit of continuing to do those things on uh, Wednesday morning, 
Uh, Carlos will be moderating a discussion with Dr. R.K. Pachori, the uh, Nobel laureate and head of the IPCC, uh, Richard Kaufman, uh, now with New York State, but a long career in energy investment, Ted Roosevelt, the head of clean tech at Barclays, about trends and drivers for uh, the global energy system, uh, and lots of other events that for those of you who follow the center, you'll see coming out soon. Follow us uh, on Twitter. If you miss any of our events, we now have them available on podcast for download through iTunes. So lots of ways to make sure you get our content moving forward. So uh, thanks to all of you, and thanks everyone for coming tonight.